some wise dudes loading up the U-Haul and teenagers today on another episode of the Bible in one year with the preacher's husband. Today we're going through Matthew chapter 2 and also Luke chapter 2 verses 39 through 52. Now tomorrow we're going to jump into three different sections of the Bible. We're going to do Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 3 tomorrow. So let's jump in because there's a lot to talk about today. We get to Matthew chapter 2 and here we are. The wise men visiting the king. The king, but which king? Okay, so these wise men that are mentioned here, they are magi. Now, they are eastern magi. Now, um, they kind of mixed Zoroastrianism with astrology and black magic. Now, they are described in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 2, verse 4 and 5, and verse 10, where they're associated with diviner priests, mediums, and sorcerers. Now, the term magos, which um, appears only once in the New Testament, it's not, it doesn't appear here. This is just says wise men, but that's what they're referring to as the magi. It describes them... As a sorcerer, and, and Paul is the one describing this sorcerer in the New Testament. When he, he portrays this sorcerer or this magi as full of all kinds of deceit and trickery and a son of the devil and an enemy of all that is right. And that's in Acts chapter 13 verses 6 through 10 that we'll look at later. Um but the summons of the Magi to visit Jesus, this kind of demonstrates God's intention to save Gentiles from their futile religion. So they're especially portraying these Magi. Paul later d- portrays them as bad, but these are people who, they notice something different in the sky, clearly, because they're into astrology. So if there's any difference going on in the sky with any of the stars, these guys are going to be the ones that will notice it first. And here we see that even in Christ's infancy, as a baby or a small child here, Christ is um, plundering Satan's kingdom and setting captives free, including these magi who have come to worship him. How interesting is that? Verse 2 here, the question is posed by the wise men was a, kind of an unintentional challenge to Herod's Um, reign because Jesus was born king in the sense that he was from David's line and thus king by birthright. Herod, however, was neither full Jew nor a descendant of David and thus was not really genuinely qualified to reign as king as we know that he was just kind of propped up by the Romans there. He he was kind of one of those that he was just hired by the Romans to be a king. Now, he was an an able ruler, but he was pretty brutal, and he was kind of a suspicious character here. We get to verse 3, and Herod was disturbed by the reports of the birth of a legitimate claimant to his throne, and it says the people of Jerusalem were disturbed as well, and this was because they feared Herod's paranoia and his delusional rages that he has he has shown in the past in the past he'd actually killed even his favorite wife and sons in order to protect his own throne and his rule we get to verse 4 herod summoned these expert scribes to learn where in the old testament it was said that the christ would be born and of course they knew the scripture well enough that they knew exactly where it was. Thus, the value of biblical revelation was upheld here, even as new revelations were unfolding as we go. So they tell him that Bethlehem is where Christ's going to be born. And knowledge of Scripture here, you got to keep in mind, does not guarantee that your heart is right with God, because doesn't Satan himself probably knows the Bible and Scripture better than we do? Yet he's not a good dude. So just because we know a bunch about the scripture and even if we know every single word of the bible and can repeat it doesn't mean that our heart is in the right place so that's the important thing here to think about in chapter 2 verse 7 and 8 here herod questions the magi about the exact time of the star's appearance now on the basis of this day, he ordered the execution of all male children in Bethlehem, two years of age and under. Now, Herod pretended to desire to worship the Messiah's 
highlight and this kind of highlights his deceitfulness and i have a feeling that maybe these wise men may have sensed that deceitfulness because when the king says yeah report back to me about where he's at so i can go worship him too and then those wise men knew that he wasn't even a jew why would he want to go worship the king of the jews of course here they were as um sorcerers and they were magi they were not you know jews either but here they were going to worship him as well so but they may have sensed his his um his deceitfulness now verses 9 through 12 here in contrast to the stable that jesus was born in jesus's family now lives in a house as a magi come to visit they're not visiting him in the stable they're visiting him in a house so this shows that the magi visited jesus after the visit of the shepherds that were described by luke earlier the magi they worshiped jesus openly though in this and they brought him gifts we get to verse 13 and 14 and again an angel visited joseph in a dream warning him of herod's intent and i'm wondering if possibly the magi who left and they returned to their own country via another route in other words they left and went a different way back home just so Herod couldn't track them down because they were supposed to report back to Herod and didn't. They probably feared that maybe there might be repercussions for not doing what they told Herod. So they kind of went a secret route back home, so to speak. At least that's what I call it. And Joseph um, here promptly obeys when he was told to flee to Egypt in particular. Now, the calling of the son out of Egypt is actually in Hosea chapter 11 but now this was a reference to the exodus from Egypt not a young Messiah's trip back home but Matthew understood this and under the spirit's direction he recognizes that Jesus is the new mo is kind of a new Moses so to speak who will lead a new and climactic exodus so just as Moses delivered his people from slavery um, to Pharaoh Jesus will deliver people from slavery to Satan. So out of slavery from sin, basically, is what Jesus is to lead them from, just as Moses was leading them out of slavery from Pharaoh. Um, we get into verse 16 here. And of course, Herod kills all the boys two years old and under in and around Bethlehem because the star had appeared to the Magi two years previously, presumably at the moment of Jesus's birth. Now, in Matthew <clears throat> verse 18 here, he quotes Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 15, which originally expressed the lament of mothers who grieved over sons who were sent into exile. Now, Matthew's application here implies that Israel was again in exile, estranged from God and in need of redemption. In other words, they were they were in living in sin, essentially. And Jeremiah 31 includes the weeping and then climaxes with the joyous promise that God would establish a new covenant with his people one in which he would forgive their sins and write his law on their hearts matthew likely intended here to call this to mind and apply it to the bethlehem massacre and the coming of jesus just as the weeping of mothers preceded the promise of the new covenant in Jer jeremiah 31 now the weeping of mothers preceded the establishment of the new covenant through jesus now we get to verse 19 and of course Herod dies. So if he died in 4 BC that we know historically, that says that Jesus was born roughly two years before Herod ordered the massacre of Bethlehem, the Bethlehem boys. It seems like Jesus was probably born in 5, 6, maybe 7 BC. And it seems likely that the shameless Bethlehem massacre was probably one of Herod's very final acts as king before he died. And we get to verses 20 and 21. This was interesting to me. Verse 20 in particular, the angel's words here were almost identical to the words that the Lord spoke to Moses from the burning bush in Exodus chapter 4, verse 19. This allusion to Moses' narrative again identifies Jesus kind of as a new Moses, which is a theme that Matthew has throughout his book when he's talking about Jesus. So Jesus now perhaps three years old or three, maybe four, he returns from Egypt with his family. And we get this new king, right? So here he is returning from Egypt with his family. And our 
Kelius, the son of Herod, is now the king, and he has inherited almost all of Herod's violent traits. So Joseph, knowing this, leads his family instead of back to Bethlehem. They resettle into Nazareth, where they had come from before. And Matthew states that the decision was for fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah will be called a Nazarene. Well, couldn't really find where it said that the Messiah was going to be called a Nazarene, but it's probably referring to Isaiah 11 verse 1, where it talks about the Messiah as being a branch and Nazareth being kind of a branch of, of um, this country. The first three consonants here of the word branch or NZR, and that composed the nouns Nazareth or Nazarene. So you can link the word branch to the word Nazareth or Nazarene biblically, and then you can get that he would be called a Nazarene. So that's why he says this here. So that gets us into Nazareth, and now we go to Luke chapter 2, verse 39 through... 52. So here we are in Luke. And right off the bat, verse 39, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Now the boy grew up and became strong and filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. So we get to verses 41 and 42 here. Now the adult Jewish males and their families were expected to to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the annual festival of Passover and Pentecost and shelters every year. That was just that expectation. These were ceremonies. And at the age of 13 was the time that was marked when a Jewish male would be recognized as a man. And that's still true today. You heard the, the term bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah. Um, since Jesus was now 12 years old, this was his very last Passover before he would become an adult. Now, of course, Joseph and Mary, after all this happened, they go traveling back to Nazareth. And it was a whole day as they were traveling before they realized that Jesus wasn't there. And this was probably fairly normal for them because they all traveled in groups. And, you know, that I was saying it takes a village to raise a child. Well, they would all kind of together decide who's going to ride with who. And the parent, kids didn't always ride with the parents. And parents didn't always ride with the kids, this kind of stuff. They were, they were going traveling in groups here. So... They went a whole day before they realized that Jesus wasn't there. And they're like, wait a minute. He's usually with these folks probably over here, and he's not. So we're going to have to go back. So then they travel a second day to come all the way back, and a third day to search for Jesus. And they hear, there they find him with the teachers who were rabbis and scholars of the Mosaic Law. It was very highly unusual, though, for a boy to be welcomed by a group of magis, much less amaze them with brilliant scriptural understanding. It wasn't that he had knowledge of the scripture, but that he understood what they were saying so well. So Joseph and Mary did not understand that Jesus was referring to his heavenly father here when he said, didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? They didn't quite grasp that concept yet, but that he also had to obey his heavenly father as much as he had to obey his earthly parents now the phrase in verse 51 keep all these things in her heart like in verse 19 that we read about yesterday implies that mary herself was luke's source for much of the unique material in chapter one and two here in luke the book of luke and that is what i have for you today I hope this has helped you with your studies. If it has, click that like button, subscribe button. Of course, click the little jingle bell so you can get notified the next time I upload a video. And if you're rumbling with me on Rumble, hit that little boxing glove. And I hope to see you again tomorrow for another episode of the Bible in one year with the preacher's husband. We'll see you then.